Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. I'm so excited to present today's video. We had a chance to talk to Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird together and go through Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Number three, pinch me, Ed. It blows my mind, but it was a fantastic conversation. We're recording this after the fact, so we already know that uh, it's a great conversation. You guys are going to love it. Um, thanks for supporting the channel and share this video because we'd love to do have Kevin and Peter come back and talk more turtles. So we need this video to do well if we're going to lure them back into cartoonist kayfabe. Enjoy the video. So let's take a look at issue number three. Yes, please. And the first thing that strikes me, we, we've looked at this before on our show because it's so rare to do... Cars are hard to draw. A chase with a couple of cars, very hard to draw. <laughs> it feels like you guys are really challenging yourself, uh, you know, with, with this as your story idea. Here's the other challenge, too. Like, at least in a color version, you could really sell the idea that they're the same color and all of that. But you just have the, the you're bound by black and white in a couple of gray tones. And these are, we're, we're talking with the men who chose themselves to make this comic yes. this would be like jim shooter would make you make this comic if he was mad at you yes right <laughs> but you guys chose to uh to have this car chase but so are you, are you guys uh, what's the question are you guys masochists uh, is it like what? possibly <laughs> I, I think credit or credit is due uh, this was really kevin's idea i remember when we when we did this book he said i want to do the longest coolest car chase that's ever been seen in comics <laughs> he did it <laughs> it was you know and and i think um well thank you and then i also think it's uh it was one being naive um <laughs> in, in in many ways that there were you know there were there were there were two guys in the company and two bosses and so we decided what we wanted to do, how we wanted to do it, and how to approach it. You know, even this idea that we still continued for a number of issues doing very long issues, you know, 35 to 40 pages, 30, 35 plus pages. But it was one of those things that we, by the time we got past issue two, we found that we we really loved um, April O'Neil as a character. And we both were fond of strong, you know, female characters. So we wanted to keep her, you know, into the story. Um, keep her in the story um as part of the family and then um and it was just a funny idea that i i just you know and it maybe it's from those days of sitting in a living room while pete pete's watching a team or tj hooker or something i said like well, we should we should do a car chase and it was kind of like you know well we should do a car chase. and so i think we then set about how to tell it in an interesting way and cars are also very hard to draw so it was a uh, um kind of a we we pushed ourselves and and we had the freedom to do that and that was kind of the 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 the, the fun part um of, of making that happen so it was um you know and i think that's that was sort of really set in motion um at least to me is you know because a lot of people you know say when they looked into the next issue next issue suddenly we've got you know this this new york city based concept and they're going into outer space and pete and i were big huge star wars geeks um hope you should make pete show you the the star the stormtrooper costume he made in college which <laughs> sent me uh, a photo yes then <laughs> um but we we're big star wars fans and so i think this was really the start of you know let's we're writing stuff that i think we want to see and we're pushing ourselves artistically and 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 so it was um yeah went, and we're because we couldn't, you know, we weren't, you know, we weren't heavy drinkers that, in those days. Yeah. So we can't blame it on that, I guess. <laughs> it's really great from the, um, you know, the creator own perspective, because you guys could do whatever you wanted. You know, like you took advantage of that freedom in a way that you wouldn't see with the corporate comics, where it's like, hey, if we want to do a space story, let's do a space story. We like mm -hmm. Star Wars. Let's go to outer space with our characters. That would be an impossible sell, possibly to Jim Shooter, you know, if you had that level of editorial uh, gatekeeping. Yeah, you don't see Spider-Man in space too often. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like marker color uh, for this cover spread. I see some. It oh, look like that was um, you know, again, you know, Peter was so much more experienced in not only techniques and other things that he was the one that, you know, when we were looking to color, um, do that second um, added color to issue one, you have to create a separate printing plate. So um, Pete. Um, using vellum and this um kind of a red 
uh, I think it was a reddish ink. It was called Ruby Lith. Um, maybe it was a maybe it used black ink. I'm not sure. But then yeah, it was done in black. It was done in black. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, so he would you'd make you create where you wanted those colors to lay um, uh, as a complete second printing plate. And so with this, I think it was the first time I tried it because Pete, when he did issue two with the airbrush and stuff, which came out so fantastic uh, with this one, it was. Uh, um, so I think I tried my hand at, at, at figuring out how to make that make that work. Yeah, and you, you may remember, Kev, that the, we, we were I think we were going to a show in Atlanta. <laughs> And I know we, where you're going with this. <laughs> we wanted to get some some issue copies of issue three printed. They had printed all the guts. They had just hadn't done the co cover yet. Yep. And uh, so we, I think we got like three three hundred or four hundred, maybe five hundred. I can't remember of these things printed. But what happened was the the printer forgot to to um, half tone the co co color overlay that you had done, which yeah. which resulted in really blocky colors on. The covers of those those limited number of, of copies, and then then when when we came back, we we made sure the printer printed another bunch of copies of the cover, and did it correctly. Yeah, no, that's one hundred percent right. It was because it was one of the. I think we when we went to pick them up and we saw the blotch <laughs> in the cover, we were both kind of kind of mortified because it's yeah. already you know we'd gone back to the messy desk guy and uh, um, he'd already messed up you know, not doing a gloss cover for issue two. And then with this advanced copies and we get them up and it's this big blotchy sort of like, we have to take these. Cause I think we, like you said, we were just leaving to go to a show. Yeah. We picked them up to take with us. And, uh, but man, so, um, <laughs> That's so funny. Back to back to the specifics here. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a softball up up in the air because I know there's a story behind it. But uh, did either of you dr uh, drive a uh, VW minibus or microbus <laughs> yourself? Like uh, where where did that reference come from? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think we talked about this a little bit before, but um, we started looking for photo reference for a VW van um, and could not find it for the life of us. Uh, you know, nowadays it would be the work of two seconds. You just go on Google and, and look for VW van. But we looked in books, we looked in magazines, we looked all over the place, and finally found in the magazine a photo about, you know, yay big, and it was a photo of a traffic jam in some big city, and right in the middle of it there was a tiny little VW bus, probably like a half inch by a half inch. That we use to give us some, at least some reference for for how the VW bus looked. And the curious thing is, as I remember, um, we we had done the whole issue. Get, got, it may have even have gone to print. And I was riding back to my house one day, and lo and behold, at the bottom of the drive that that we used to go up to get to our house, there's a garage that was open, and there was a VW minivan sitting in the garage <laughs> all, all the, been there all the time and we've never known it yeah it, that, it, that feels like a perfect artist story like get the complete issue done and then you start spotting VW totally. mini buses all <laughs> over the place yeah. no i think it was because we had the discussion of uh use we we as we were building the idea about what the car chase would be and and how because april has to go pick up the turtles and so we needed a vehicle for them to all fit in as well and it was just funny because I found this <clears throat> again recently in my books. But and uh, when I was in eighth grade, I went to visit my dad in Arizona, and he had a he had a, uh, a yeah. copy of the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. And I was <laughs> so I, I was wondering, thinking to myself, it's like I would have seen this before we did that. So I wonder if it was kind of a combination of mm. pretty much everything Pete said, um, you know, in the idea that we needed something to fit all the turtles in. But I was just like, oh my god, I wonder <laughs> if that's where. It was a little splinter in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. If if that's you know how these ideas get planted, I was going to suggest in the beginning maybe that's the easiest car to draw because it's such a, a rectangle of a form. <laughs> it's it's visually interesting. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of personality in one of those. Yeah. I just want to jump in here and and just because Kevin raised this in my brain just now by holding up the, that that book the fur, the furry freak brothers. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes we, we give short shrift to the effect of the underground comic scene on us 
And the more I look at these things in, in preparation for talking with you guys, the more I think we were really taught by the underground comic artists and publishers that it was okay to do your own thing, you know, to do the book you wanted to do and, and print it in black and white. You know, screw color, you don't need that. But that, that's something that I've just been realizing more and more as we talk about this stuff. No, it was really, um, you're 100% right. It was one of those things that, um, you know, uh, we talked about issue two and the dream coming true with being able to draw comics. And, you know, we'd both submitted, you know, samples to, to, to larger publishers and collected, you know, the, the obvious um, rejection notices and things. And, and I think it was a lot of these underground artists that you would see the certain section in a head shop slash comic store and some of them were heavily sex and drugs and and kind of stuff uh, some of the early crumb stuff but it was really steadily evolving into something that was becoming uh um attainable for people that wanted to do their own kinds of stories and in their own creations um and so you started seeing um do you remember there was an underground comic called star reach um which yeah. Uh, yeah, like um, Frank Bruner, I think, and uh, Jake and a bunch. So you started seeing the steady evolution of s strictly, say, underground and mainstream, if you will. Um, and then it started, the underground started shifting a bit more to the to the middle, where you might call it ground level, I guess, for lack of a better term. And so it was that that path that that Pete and I really latched onto as a as a thing. It's it was. Uh, because it was, that was it. We were, you know, we weren't made fun of in high school all those years for being comic book geeks that we weren't going to make a career out of this. <laughs> it's, I, it's so fascinating I to get that on the record because I think about like, to me, like the guy who bridges that gap is Richard Corbin because he's doing stories in the undergrounds, but they're like genre stories, you know, signing his name Gore right. in Fantagore and stuff. But then he bridges the gap. He does the creepy and the eerie and hooks up with Jim Warren and stuff. So pushes yep. things more to, to that level. And then, and then he works for, yeah, I mean, he does turtle stories. He does great turtle stories. Yeah, there's, um, it's hard to see, but that's his cover. Pete and I were, we were able to get his cover for uh, Turtles issue two, the third printing of issue two um, that we commissioned um, uh, Richard to do, a, to do a piece on it, which... Um, there's some better actually it, true, that was one for you yeah <laughs> um but it's fun actually not to you know to plug something but i think it's uh, i'm gonna anyway um but what's interesting is the timing of our chat is um just it's about to be released any day now is um i was able to put together a um it's one of the ultimate collection series um and this is ultimate collection number seven which shows um i was able to um, from my archives, pull just about every pencil, ink, and color version of just every cover that Peter and I did together and, and forms, whether it was individually or together. Um, so things like, you know, some of the reprint covers, some of the other Archie covers. It, so it goes through, um, you know, not only the original Mirage issues, it goes through Mirage the Color Volume 2, it goes through the um, uh, um, role-playing game covers. And, and beyond so it's a really neat and there's a bunch of photos and some really fun stuff in there some behind the scenes stuff so um people that are watching this want to see some really cool um you know like i just bought like when you want to if you want to see peter laird's pencils on the reprint of issue three before jim lawson inked him you can see him in this book it's that kind of stuff that you get some real some real treasures that i was uh, uh able to keep in my pack writing self so I am so grateful for that pack ratting self, Kevin. <laughs> it's 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 so nice to have that. And you know, to just build on what Ed said about that underground connection, I love hearing that. And what you described, Peter, you know, like being able to just make these in black and white, make whatever you want. I feel like for our generation, that's what we found in in the Ninja Turtles. You know, it really was this. It felt like rule breaking again compared to the Marvel DC stuff that a lot of us. That's what we saw first, and then this was sort of like training wheels off, like just do what you want to do. And it's amazing that, you know, you have a call back to before your time that, that had, that gave you that message. Yeah. 
It's really true. I mean, there was so much in the underground comics world that we appreciated and, and loved. And it, and it ended up in, informing a lot of what happened with the Turtle books. Have All you, right. um, Peter, have you seen this uh, Ultimate Collection 7 that, that Kevin was just talking about putting together? Uh, the, I, I, I have not seen that. It's, um, well, no, <laughs> um, Fiona's got some copies for you. Hey! <laughs> She's got to print stuff up. But I, I want to just, you know, po pointing to the... Uh, Corbin thing reminded me of something very, very special I want to bring up. And this goes back to the very first time I met Peter Laird. Um, we had exchanged letters and he saved a copy of that letter and he gave it to me later. But I walked into his little studio apartment at uh, above 56 Main Street, Northampton. And the thing, first thing I see on the wall is, is this, it's a Jack Kirby pencil <laughs> original. And I just about passed out because <laughs> I'd never seen a Jack Kirby original. And Pete hanging on it, had it hanging on his wall, and he later gave it to me. So I've had it as a treasure in my studio every day since. And uh, what a great! It's a unfinished pencil from the Losers. So that's, that's a, and so that's that was. And I tell people often when they, you know, besides you know creatively that Peter and I um, really hit it off. Which actually in Ultimate Collection Seven, I also show a reprint, Don't Sleep on Main Street, and I'm Only a Loser, a couple of the short stories that we actually did together um, from that evolved out of that first meeting. But uh, we we pretty much bonded over Kirby um, quite instantly, <laughs> quite instantly. I think he leaned more towards New Gods and Forever People, and I leaned more towards Commandy. No, you were a demon guy. That was it. You were a demon guy. Demon guy, Jack Kirby's demon. Yeah. So anyway, that's a treat that, you know, um, P only people that come see me here in the studio get to see. So we get to, I'm glad we get to share. Beautiful. The, uh, and the following up on that, um, years later, Kevin was the guy who helped me get a, a whole bunch of Kirby originals, which I treasure, including a whole bunch of demon pages. That's so cool. Mm. That is awesome. <laughs> oh, and I, I, I got to do this. Um, give me one. Oh, minute. man, we're putting our dicks on the table today. <laughs> <laughs> Slap them out, man. Put it on the table. <laughs> No, it's uh, you know, it's it's fun. I think that uh, I was really thrilled that you guys um, um, that that Pete did the the the. As I talked to you before, and I was yeah. so excited and happy when Fiona sent me the link of uh, Pete being on your show, and then to invite us both back to to, to visit and hang out like this is just um, it's just epically wonderful. I'm really uh, really listen, thrilled. Listen, uh, let's do it again, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> That's right. All right, well, what do you got there, buddy? Oh yeah! Oh, Woo, yeah. There he goes, the turtles. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. That thing is so dope! Wow, man, that is so rad. And that was, uh, um, in this, it was one of those things. It was such an an awesome and incredible and thoughtful gesture on uh, uh, Mr. Jack Kirby and his and his amazing, lovely, wonderful wife, wife Roz, is that. You know, Peter and I would keep in touch with them regularly. And, and when Pete uh, reached out to them with uh, his idea for the Donatello one shot, which was so fantastic. Um, it was around the time when Kirby was um, having some loud legal discussions with Marvel to not only get his art back and stuff. And we we just loved him so much. And um, and I think even at this time, Jack was getting on in years and uh, um, wasn't doing as much drawing as he used to, you know, which is amazing. The guy used to draw 14 hours a day i've heard and and often when he was at dc comics he was doing like four four titles a month that he was writing and, and penciling um but but we'd asked him for a pinup at one time and i think it was one of those it was again a bit towards the end um and Roz got up to do that pencil and he sent it to us and i think pete and i both nearly passed out it was just one of those like you know it's like um because he was you know, not to carry on too much longer and digress, but I just, I know we both can't say enough about Kirby, but um, I will say that, you know, people will warn you sometimes to not, you know, be afraid to meet your heroes because you, you don't want to be disappointed. And and I've met some heroes of mine that have been very disappointed, but Kirby was was all that and, and, and so much more. He was such a genuine, lovely, awesome person, and he dearly loved his fans. And uh, that... The fact that he did that drawing, um, it just it embodies everything that made him such a incredible guy. 
to us so, and, and so many other people. So, so here's the question. I mean, it is one piece, and, and Peter has it. Uh, paper, rock, scissors, <laughs> coin flips. Like, like how how does it go? My memory of, of that is that Kevin had it and he gave it to me. And beyond oh. that, I, I don't know any any uh, other uh, history of it. Well, I'll, I I I'll take that credit because um, it's very thoughtful. But it's uh, um, but yeah. Um, I remember a coin toss, but uh, and then I beat you up in the alley afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I don't know what happened. Somebody jumped him and robbed. No, it's um, uh, but that it's... happens. That happens here often, and we, and we always joke that uh, the, the team's going to get split because, like, we have a PO box that just we leave out in the ether, and people just send us crap, and and, and sometimes it's amazing stuff. And there's one mm, copy, yeah. and the coin toss is always the uh, equalizer. <laughs> Well, that was like back in the day when we, you know, when Pete and I would divide up pages on stories we worked together. It was always a, a coin toss to see you. We'd lay out all the pages on the floor and it'd be a coin toss to see you get to pick first. And then that print, you know, and then you'd go back and forth picking pages until the, the yeah. book was divided in our collection. So yeah. the equalizer, yeah. man, like look, looking, looking back at uh, issue three, one mm -hmm. of the things that really struck me is that uh, we are now really establishing personalities for these turtles uh up to mm. up to this point there there might be a little bit of a leadership quality in leonardo and things like that but but it's it's it seems like you guys are very very conscious of giving these characters their own personalities here we see the hotheadness of of raf uh before like around here we see mm -hmm. the leadership aspects even deeper with um Leonardo, so so, uh, am I right in assuming this is the the point where you guys really start to think that out, or you just have more pages to establish that? Is it the archetypes established when you guys first put the comics together with issue one? Uh, I don't know. Can you take that question, Kevin? Well, you know, it's what I re what what I remember, and 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 um, chime in is that we, um, we a couple of the things that we were. I don't say struggling with a bit, but it was which was figure, and I would say more more appropriately, I guess, figuring out um, one kind of being a black and white comic. We the only way you could really identify them per se was um, by the weapons. So a lot of times you'll or when they're having a dialogue exchange, you know, you they'll say like you know refer to them Mike or Donnie mm -hmm. or whatever, so you could tell who's who. But it was um, the evolution of this idea, and I think leaning, or at least to me, it. I would lean back on, say, I know Pete and I both shared a, a love for the Fantastic Four, and um, and we liked the idea of, you know, you've got kind of the Ben Grimm character and the hothead, and you get the the the, the more scientific one, but it was that individual personalities that started emerging to help define their personalities as well as, um, you know, later on or as part of the success of superhero groups like x-men or fantastic four and things that when they would fracture and argue like families can at times adoptive or otherwise it was um the fact when they you know under the res you know respect of their father or just bonding together as a team that they could overcome such um, um uh, evil obstacles and be the the heroes that we we wanted them to be so it was we we were learning and i think it was slowly coming together and it was they were evolving and that was yeah. that was the fun i would agree with kevin on that and just say that as each as we did each book we just had more context to draw on you know with, to make the characters more individualistic um and it, it just got more i think it sort of organically developed over the course of the succeeding issues what issue uh around what issue of the regular series do you guys start playing around with uh, the idea of putting out these micro series to like really flesh out each individual character? Is it directly after this issue, the next issue? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, did, we did Raphael around that time, didn't we, Kev? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just I was immediately digressing to one of my favorite Pete Pete Laird lines, which was uh, when they're going through the the park in the van. And they go over the bridge and the guy's jumping. He's like, holy hippo spit. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, if I recall, um, one of the neat things that um, some of the mainstream publishers were starting to do around this time were 
these four issue um, um, mini series. And so it would be instead of having a, a reader sort of join in on a Iron Man and it's already up into issue 200 or something or Captain America, that they would do these individual stories, uh, the four issue mini series, which then, you know, helped evolve the part of the um, trade paperback business, which then they put the four into a collection and do it. But, and so I think Peter and I joked and I, I said, mini series, mini series. And I said, well, why don't we do, wouldn't it be funny, probably around the discussion of trying to evolve their personalities a little bit more. I said, why don't we do something like a one issue micro series? <laughs> so it would just be one issue featuring um, one turtle. And you'll notice um, where the longer stories, the regular issues we were doing were much um, uh, longer, you know, 35 plus pages with the, with the micro series, a lot of times we'd keep them shorter, maybe um, under 30 pages, maybe 20, 20, which isn't that much shorter, but I guess it's more, you know, about shorter. So, um, so yeah, Raphael was the first one um, that we did. And then, oh God, Chris, the Christmas one, the Michelangelo, which. Um, the snowfall one. A lot of snow. The, <laughs> but uh, I, I, my, my favorite memory I tell at uh, comic conventions about, um, uh, about the, that Michelangelo issue and not to jump ahead guys, but it just makes me laugh. Cause I mentioned earlier that, uh, my spelling was atrocious. It was horrible. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and so in the early issues, I didn't realize until I did Michelangelo and somebody pointed out, you know, you're spelling Michelangelo wrong. Right. And I, and I said, what? <laughs> Cause it's <laughs> Michael, a, a E L Angelo. And I, I think I, you know, and I don't, I may not be running pretty, but I remember going like, I thought this was the right way to spell it. And you said, well, no, you spell it wrong, but I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> that, that came as a shock to me as well when, when we were corrected on that. I was like, holy <laughs> crap, we've been spelling it wrong for all this time. It's just <laughs> oh, too funny. But hey, uh, I want to ask you, Kevin, um, as far as you know, has anybody ever told you that they understand the joke behind the one issue micro series? No. And the joke is, you can't have a series if it's just one thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I remember when we did that originally, it, it was pretty funny to, to me, at least. I don't know if you, you found it. Maybe, but, but no one's ever point, pointed that out. Oh, my God. That's funny, because didn't it say at the top, like, number one in a one issue micro series it's amazing. <laughs> like, like if that always cracked me up because you would see that with the marvel you guys were kind of playing off the the, the marvel limited series at the time like uh vision oh my god and yeah, scarlet yeah. witch and it would have that little typography at the top taking a quick break to uh pay the bills got to let you guys know that we have a patreon and uh the king kayfabers on our patreon are getting all of these videos uh, well before Gen Pop, and that includes this exact conversation with Eastman and Laird that uh, we are putting out into the world right now. They're getting these videos first. It mitigates the kayfabe effect, but these videos are also brought to you by the books that we make. Uh, out in the wild right now, I have uh, Red Room Crypto Killers issue number one is being uh, solicited to your comic shops. There are two other trade paperbacks, Red Room Trigger Warnings, uh, Red Room uh, The Antisocial Network, it's the 10th anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree. There are four volumes of that, uh, three volumes of X-Men Grand Design, and uh, the occasional WYSIWYG you may find out in the wild. Jimmy, tell the people what you have out there. I have Hulk Grand Design. It is coming to comic book stores shortly. If you haven't gotten it already, you should pre-order it. I like to think of it as the best looking Hulk book ever made. So pick it up and judge for yourself. My next book is Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. That is the 20th anniversary of Street Angel. It'll be collecting all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive and will look very nice on the shelf next to Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive. And uh, the first young adult graphic novel, The Plain Janes, is also available from me and Cecil Castellucci. You love us, right? We got Eastman and Laird back together to talk Turtles comics. Support the channel. Let's get back to the video. Yes. Whenever you guys would put out one of those singular uh, comics, would uh, would that take place of one of the regular issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Like, uh, like would you skip an issue five in the schedule to put a Raphael out, and then you know issue five comes out later, something like that? You know, that's a good question. I I don't think we were fast enough to you know keep pace with 
with uh, you know one issue and then start another issue at the same time. I think it was probably in between issues, just uh, like fill in space between issues. Yep. If no, I, I I totally agree. I think it was just the uh, um, again being the um, the only the only two guys in the driver's seat. It was really it, it sort of we were able to um, make decisions like that. Like, hey, wouldn't it be funny to do a to do a Christmas the Christmas issue and 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 with Michelangelo and because I think we were both like things like Halloween or um, snow or winter would be one of the few times that the turtles could actually go out, you know, fully dressed and fully covered up. And and, then, and I think we were also kind of pretty big fans of the, the movie, the Christmas story. And, uh, uh, and I think, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I think it's that that's when you see like uh, him looking in the window at Chet's toys was kind of right after the, right out of, you know, that, seen in the Christmas and, stories. Oh, for sure. and given that we've mentioned uh, the Raphael micro series in, um, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to say a couple of things about that. Number one, that's that's a Kevin Eastman joint. He did that whole thing, came up with all that by himself with minimal input from me. Um, but I also wanted to make, make an observation that in that micro series, the Raphael micro series, um, I, th I can't remember if it's he and Casey or just Casey or just Raphael beats up on two guys who are <laughs> ladies first. And those two guys are Kevin and myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, uh, well, that was, you know, and I'd say that, you know, well, thank you for the, uh, you know, I, one of the things I, I think that um, when I look back at some of those issues, the, the, the way a lot of, you know, the, those issues, all those issues evolved, because it was there was two people talking about ideas and and that was so you had two strong creative minds um and and just working together and i think you know none of this you know not yeah there they are there we are <laughs> i noticed how we i think i made sure that we both had much bigger muscles than we did then or you gotta do that you, you gotta, gotta do, do that all cartoonists draw yeah. themselves a little bulkier absolutely yeah <laughs> um but I think they all evolved out of, uh, it was just, um, yeah, couldn't have happened without each other. And, 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 you know, maybe one, you know, it was much like I say that, you know, maybe I took more of a point on that one, much like, you know, the Donatello one shot is, is definitely, you know, pretty much all hundred percent Pete is a, is a concept and idea, but it's sort of, you know, we're working in the same playground with the same ideas. Um, actually, I want to throw something in here. This is something I, I actually wanted to test you guys on. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> and I know we're kind of going far afield here, but there is one page in the Donatello micro series that I did not lay out. I challenge you to discover it. Oh, that's, a, that's, a good <laughs> that's a good question. I'm going to have to text you that. I got to give you a look. <laughs> yeah, that feels like one to throw out to the cafe by fandom yeah. and have some fun out there yeah, this, this may be obvious but it's not it's not me it's kevin yep <laughs> it's not somebody else like jim lawson or mike Dooney. it's it's kevin right you know it's, it's you know what i love so much about looking you know jumping back to issue three is that we again were able to do stuff like this yeah which is just you know two full page spreads yes. that we Yes, I wanted to make note on that. That that's such an interesting that you never see that in mainstream comics. It's such an interesting pacing thing to to have kind of two money shots. Yeah. It was to me. It was like sort of like as I think both Peter and I were of the of the mind kind of early on is that you know it's it's and and probably that you know and I you know for the fifty billionth time I'll mention Jack Kirby is uh, oh, no not again. <laughs> it's, uh, um every every time we say jack kirby we have to do a shot no the um <laughs> no the uh one of the beautiful things about the kirby stories a lot of times with those two page spreads is that he would show you where the story was taking place um so that then you could go to more close-up more intimate storytelling scenes without doing stuff but when he would do those you know the next chapter and it would be a full page spread it really kind of set the scene of where you were going. And that's something we took to heart with all those early books as often as possible that would have a two page spread or would have a big chapter break. Um, especially when we were, 
we took them into outer space and later issues of things that really sort of set up that environment um, um, and, and help. We wanted to show the place that we were seeing in our heads and, and, and where the story, you know, to make it more immersive. And I, I'm probably making it sound like we were much cleverer, cleverer than we were, but we, we were figuring it out. But that was, uh, I always liked that. We were able to do that. It's a really interesting rule break. One of the things in issue three in particular, as we've been going through here, it feels so cinematic. And those full page splashes have that moment. Um, I think issue one, there's that full page splash of the empty street that has that moment yeah. where it feels very cinematic. Are you guys like um, teaching each other as you're working together? Like, are you watching movies together? Or are you sort of talking craft through that whole process? Uh, uh, maybe to some degree sort of unconsciously. I don't, I don't think we ever really um, had long discussions about what we were doing in terms of how the pages were laid out or whatever. Do you, do you feel that way, Kev? No, well, I think you, when you said subconsciously, because I think we were, you know, big big genre fans of, of lots of different, you know, from the early Star Treks to, you know, even some of the cop shows, you know, I pity the fool, you know. Um, <laughs> The things, you know, when you start seeing like Terminator, and I think even what's funny is you mentioned it, it was in it, but I think it was more subconsciously, like when you see this scene here where they finally catch the crooks in the van and our guys are able to get away and you have them completely surrounded right. by cops. To me, it feels like a scene out of the Blues Brothers, you know, when the Blues Brothers finally get to the, and, you know, they're, they're paying the $5,000 to save the orphanage uh -huh. and you know, they turn around and the whole army's behind them with all the guns <laughs> pointing. So I think it was like subconsciously, be, because I think as we worked our way through the story we wanted to tell, it was necessity for, we need to show this to show you what happens next in the story. So it was a natural organic evolution, but, um, you know, we, we, we leaned heavy on things that we, we loved about movies. Uh, well, you know, I think it, we love things that we loved about movies and things that actions that we saw and, and things that were uh, inspirational to us. Um, yeah. yeah so. um, you know, and I think Kevin uh, has always had a, a very cinematic feel to his layouts. And, the, you know, just to, to go back a couple of steps, uh, you, somebody mentioned that um, single splash page in issue one were after the turtles had defeated the purple dragons there's a street scene, which is just the street and the, the buildings and no, no, no characters on that page at all. And that was Kevin. And I think I may have mentioned this to you and you guys Ed, and the Jim, the last time we talked that that was the single real argument we had about issue number one, that Kevin wanted to put that page in and I didn't. And we argued about it back and forth. And he finally convinced me that it was a good idea. And in the years since I, I've seen the wisdom of that. And uh, th that's just a, another example of how Kevin has a real cinematic approach to what he's doing. Oh, thank you. No, it was, so I know that was, you know, it, it's funny because we talked about the cost of the duo shade paper. And I think we, <laughs> part of the argument was like, well, we could probably add a lot more story here if we didn't waste it on a single, <laughs> single full page. Um, but it was just one of those. And it was the only defense was um, it just, it just felt right. I didn't, I couldn't validate, you know, anything more than, you know, um, you know, um, college trained cinematic references. Cause we didn't do, I didn't do any of that. No, it's just sort of like, it just, this felt like if you take a little breather here, when you go to the next page, which is an important page, um, with a return home that, uh, yeah, it just, yeah, I always say, you know, uh, um, <laughs> and it's, I just had a flash to, a. Uh, a couple of times in the early days of going to comic conventions or even um, I've meet, I've met fans uh, that now work in comics um, who will look at some of the work Peter and I did early on and, and they've analyzed it to the point of everything being so intentional and perfectly told, like, you know, we were young Stanley Kubrick's or Spielberg <laughs> or something. And they would go, I know how you, you showed this and how it symbolized that and you played it off, you paid it off and the next four panels and then this evolved into that. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, that's what, that's exactly what we did. Um, uh, no, it was just very organic and it just, we felt our way through the stories that we were learning how to tell. And, and if there was something more than that, then it was just, um, um, it was, we were lucky <laughs> and ha having fun and we were lucky. Yeah. It's it's so interesting to consider you two collaborating as opposed to say a Stanley and a Jack Kirby where the 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 difference between the writer and the artist is more clearly defined but in your cases you know if something's not working on a page or one of you has another idea it, it's a very unusual collaboration uh in a lot of ways we don't see a lot of two writer artists working together and mm -hmm. passing pages back and forth and you know what comes out on the pages it's interesting decades later to look at these and you guys are sort of giving credit to each other and maybe not sure who did come up with this great idea or this panel transition. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a very interesting collaboration in that way. Yeah, this is you know, it, was, it was something, if you remember, Pete, when uh, I remember a lot of times when we would do an interview or something and people would, they would go, it's like, okay, so who's the, um, oh, I love that panel. Um, they'd go, who's the writer and who's the artist? And we would, we'd always have to explain to them and say, well, that's the great, the great thing is that we we both were individual writers and artists. We had done our own work and our own stories, so we both write and draw, um, and that was uh, the the blending of of uh, the two of us. Um, yeah, I was uh, always I, curious that, that they a lot of people couldn't quite grasp that. Yeah, you know, it just seemed really strange to them. <laughs> yeah, it's very atypical. Like the only examples I could think in 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 comics, uh, I don't even know that this stuff was really published in a real format. It would be like Charles Crumb and Robert Crumb working on pages <laughs> together. Or I think maybe there was like some Jaime and Gilbert comics when they were young, but never received like a proper, you know, published version. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wonder like a barbed wire studios oh, where, right, you, right, where right. you have James a few artists. Uh, yeah, Guy Davis, Vince Locke, and Jim, James O'Barr. I'm taking a look at this page here uh, on, on the big screen because it's just, it's an interesting uh, <clears throat> pacing choice with the it's thoughtful for the uh collections that that first put out you see clearly it's an epilogue to the issue three story uh it started off we we were we're splinter we need to find splinter that's why the characters get out from uh the subterranean but then starting off book two with the splinter piece as a prologue to uh the forthcoming like issue four sequence which really focuses on that a lot i, th I just thought that that was a very thoughtful uh, approach to the pacing of uh, of these collections. Well, that that actually kind of harkens back to that the splash page in issue one the, 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 that just shows the cityscape and the buildings. It's a, I think a really good example again of Kevin's skill in pacing in a sense of breathing, like take me you know, take a breath or more than one breath before you move on with the story. And uh, I think that that fits right into that that scheme. Yeah, and this piece has the entire tone of 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 the fourth issue for sure. You know, because yeah. I think that was um, um, by the time we were because you know again I'm, I'm what I'm trying to recall or what I think I recall is 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 this is when through the process of um, working on issue three that we. Um, and uh, we 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 started this idea of wanting to dig deeper on this, you know, what the actual ooze was and how it got here, and because it was always like one of those, you know, typical comic book science kind of things where you know they were exposed to gamma rays and uh, ice cream cones, and now they're an ice cream guy. No, I mean, you know, so there were different reasons for the origins of them, <clears throat> and it was. Um, this design where uh, we thought we could, we started building out the universe where we wanted to bring Fugitoid in. Mm -hmm. So there's some ideas of bringing Fugitoid into the Turtles universe. There was ideas of we really wanted to go to outer space, um, the development. And I love this panel, which um, I'm 99.9% .9 sure Pete laid out and did, which is the final page of issue three. Oh, yes. Which is the um, the creation of the... Um, the Utrams and the whole race of Utrams and um, the exoskeletons, um, which resulted in that just absolutely stunningly beautiful and brilliant cover four that Pete did with the, that, you know, if you ever gonna, 
you know, and I mentioned earlier Pete's design of robots and machinery that works. When you look at that transmat device that he made and the exoskeletons with the little, um, with the little, uh, you know, which later became Krang. Yeah. That stuff looked like it worked, man. Yeah. Uh, so I think, and I, and I, and again, I, unless you remember differently, Pete, I think we, we, there was a first time we said, well, let's, I don't think we said, let's do the next three issues as a big story arc, but I think we wanted to do a big, bigger story arc. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it started evolving. Yeah. What a great way to end an issue. You know what I mean? You're like, coming back. Yeah, it's that perfect cliffhanger piece. It's so brilliant. So it's three issues down, and we established Turtles, Splitter, Shredder, Foot Clan, Krang Aliens, Turtle Van, April O'Neil. Like, so much good stuff established really, really quick. So much imagination on these pages. And I want to thank you guys so much for uh, for joining us to, uh, to to look through these these issues. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And, you know, um, I'm, you know, um, um, would be more than thrilled and, and honored and, and excited to uh, continue this conversation. If you guys want to do it some more, Pete, you want to, because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite good fun because it is, um, it's been a number of years since, you know, you know, Pete and I've had a chance to go through and look at, look at these things. Um, and it's, and it's with them. Um, it's such a joy because I always laugh that, uh, um, as an artist, I always feel like I struggle with my artwork. Like I'll work on a piece until, until I, I hate it enough. I'm either going to throw it away or just, it's already late. So it has to go to press. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so it's a bit of a war. Then sometimes you look back at pieces that you struggled with and you go, Hey, <laughs> I'm we didn't suck that much. We weren't that bad. <laughs> Some of these are pretty good. Um, you know, uh, so I think it's 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 fun to look back and and because um, it does um, bring out some really um, awesome memories and, and and what a what a good time sort of figuring that stuff out because uh, I've told people before that um, you know the ones that bring up the nuances that we did and we were like we didn't really know what we were doing but we were having a really good time and we were very passionate about it and uh, and that was what um, if that came through then I think it's because we were the two big kids having a really good having a really good time here's, that's a good description here's the thing like for 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 our generation of cartoonists uh jimmy's a little older than me i'm born in 1982 your comics are so important to our generation as ma as makers uh, it's it's the the hopefulness of the success of it sure that's a part of it but nobody cares about the shit if it isn't good and these are these are really solid good comics maybe people bought the original run on, on like the original issue like on title alone but then if you don't deliver then it's sort of meaningless so you guys are incredibly important to our generation but that does make me wonder uh did you have solid a solid peer group of of makers when you were established like first putting these out like names come up steve Bissett, scott mcleod rick veach like those names come up and stuff, but mm -hmm. um, how were, were you treated well amongst uh, other professionals? Because it's so different from from you know a penciler at Marvel, and these guys are sitting around by themselves all day, a lot of time to think and come mm -hmm. up with enemies and people who don't deserve this or that. So what was the temperature like in the eighties? Because you guys are very very important to us. Well, I mean, I mean, you, this one story, and Pete, you can. Um, See if this, if you, well, here's, so um, our dear, dear, dear friend, Stan Sakai, um, started the same year we did. You know, Pete and I self-published in, in May of 84, and um, there were other comics, anthropomorphic comics, like um, Critters and Albedo and some other things that were evolving. The self-publishing movement was starting to grow. We were already um, quite fond of ElfQuest, Wendy and Richard Peeney's work, and and Dave Sim, of course, with Cerebus and, and others. But I remember I tell the story and whether it's whether it was one instance or more, but I feel like it sort of embodies the early days of what we were doing is we'd go to a show and they'd put the funny animal guys on a couple of tables near the bathrooms, you know, because those are the ones that are available. <laughs> so like, oh, it's just the funny animal guys. We'll put them over there. Um, but that's when we would meet some really nice people that were up and coming. Um, uh, 
uh, William Messer Loeb's and 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 uh, Stan Sakai and and uh, maybe you know Michael Gilbert or people that were really emerging and coming out of that time. So we were all comrades, if you will, and that we were you know following the same dream of Joshua you know, Quagmire is one of them. Yeah, Joshua Quagmire. Yes, <laughs> um, but we we had our we had our our group and it was like um you know we were we're the new guys and uh you know we you know we were still love to go over and stare at the you know the celebrities you know the marvel guys it's like you know, that we were you know fans of but um anyway but that was we had our group and and we were all on the same page because we we wanted the same thing as uh draw comics tell just, stories yeah just fantastic thank you guys so much for for joining us we we absolutely would be so thrilled to, to do it again uh it, in, in my own ideal fantasy every couple of weeks we reconnect it and do a couple more issues like and i'm very serious because uh, the, these are so such important comics and so much lip service is given to everything but the comics with you guys in, in a lot of ways you know like they're always talking about the 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 success or, or, or the TV show or the cartoon and, and, right. and the, the comics is where it was at. It's the most important part to, to us as creators. And certainly the people on this channel are giant Eastman and Laird, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fans. And, uh, I'd be, we'd be over the moon to, uh, to do this again, uh, at your earliest convenience for sure. I, I agree with Kevin that it would be fun to continue. You know, it's, it's really, uh, a dual uh, pleasure for me, at least. I, mean, I suspect it is for Kevin because uh, it's it's really interesting to hear your guys' uh, uh, really in-depth analysis of things. Plus, I don't get to see Kevin very often, and uh, we we I don't think we ever sat down and like reviewed the old issues before. So that's really interesting. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Yep, well, I'm thank totally you guys totally in, and this was a. An absolute wonderful way to spend a morning. It's great to uh, great to see you, Pete. Um, big love and hugs to the whole family, and uh, great to chat with you guys. And uh, yeah, look forward to the look forward to the next one. Thank you so Sounds much. Good. Thank you.